to tell you about today is how do injuries, specifically spinal cord injuries, affect the brain? How do we change circuitry of the brain? I'll tell you why we need to know about it. And I'll tell you some new information about how that happens. Before we go to that particular topic, a little bit about the brain. Brain is one organ in the body which is least understood. We understand how heart works, we understand how immune system works, we understand a whole lot of things about our liver, but we don't understand how does the brain work. There is absolutely no single theory which can put forward an idea about how does the brain work. Brain does simple things. A brain gets information from different senses about the world around us. And that information, when it gets into, I have to go back a little bit, gets into the brain, that information is processed. It creates a percept of the world around us. It leads to completion, that means we are putting that information together. There is learning, memory is formed, and of course, it results in consciousness finally. And there is a single output of the brain which we can call action. It could be as simple as my trying to move the slides, pressing this button, that's an action. It could be something like picking up a glass of water to drink it before, because you are thirsty. It could be something like an emotional reaction, a simple twitching of muscle or a smile. That's an action, that's the output of the brain. What is brain made up of? Brain is made up of, like all parts of the body, with cells which we call neurons. These are unique cells in the body. There are no other cells like this. They have these cell bodies. These are the dark, roundish things that you can see on your screen. And there are a lot of processes. These processes are actually wires which bring information to the cell body, which is the simplest information processing unit in the brain. And there is a wire that takes that information away from the neurons. All these neurons with these processes are interconnected into a network which is a single continuous network. We have billions of neurons in our brain and these neurons make connection with each other on what we call contact points or synapses. You can see those pointed out with this blue arrows there, those are the contact points between two different neurons. That's where neurons exchange information. There are thousands of these contact points between neurons. So now we have a brain which is billions of neurons with trillions of connections. And this is a single network. And that's what makes it so hard to understand the brain. We'll talk about only a very little subset of this uh, circuitry. But remember these processes, remember these wires, because we are going to come back to this in a little while. How does this network form? <coughs> this starts with very few cells, very few neurons. There are no billions of neurons in the beginning, but the light just starts in the embryonic stage. Uh, it's a simple tube-like structure, you can see on your left hand side. And as the embryo develops during gestation, it ends up into more and more adult brain like structure, which you can see by the time of birth on the rightmost side. This is becoming more adult like brain, but how did that happen? During this process, all these neurons are forming interconnection with a very complex but precise interplay of genetics and the environment. The end result is a process that makes us fit to live in the environment. Brain is a creation of evolution, and the only goal of evolution is to increase the fitness of individuals to live in that surroundings, to live in that environment. This process of forming connections, of eliminating wrong connections, continues in early life, but once an adult brain is there, then we don't want too many connections to change. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is we want some kind of a stability of the perception of nation. If we have learned that how to use this remote, 
then we don't want to forget it. If we have learned what does a chair feel like, how to drive, we don't want to forget it. And that's the reason that we wrote in the adult brain do not divide. That's the reason that when there are brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries due to accidents, when there is a stroke or when there are spinal cord injuries, that's what we are going to talk about more today, there is very little recovery, if at all. These are permanent disabilities, these are lifelong disabilities. But if brain is completely non-changeable, that's not going to work. And there is a reason for that. We have to form new memories. You are listening to my talk, we are forming new memories. Do you remember that, hopefully? So, some connections have to form. There is a skill learning. We can learn skill at any age. You can learn a new musical instrument, you can learn a new language. All that requires formation of new connections. Sometimes reallocation of resources in the brain. A larger number of neurons get devoted to the task that you are learning. So you devote more hardware to process that information which is more important, which requires higher level of resolution, higher level of skill. That requires some change in the brain. Then finally, the focus of today is response to injuries. Injuries either affect the brain by interrupting the flow of information coming towards the brain or going outside the brain. Both of these affect the brain. How do they affect the brain is something that we will see now. But before that, why should we actually study this? Scientists believe that this change that happens in the brain, the common term used for that is plasticity, causes something like phantom sensation. What is a phantom sensation? People who get an amputation of a limb, for example, uh, they sometimes keep on feeling that their missing limb is still there. They might feel an itch on that missing limb, it might be something that's painful, but it's a problem for them. You may not realize how much of a problem for the patient it is because there is a pain in a limb that does not exist. There is absolutely no way to relieve that pain. It's a mental construct. There is an itch on a limb that's not there. How do you relieve that itch? You can't scratch it. So, it's a problem. But for patient, it's very, very real. And scientists believe that it's the brain reorganization, the kind I am going to show you, results in these phantom sensations. Similar kind of phantom sensations are also felt by people with spinal cord injuries when connections are broken. We know that there is no sensory inputs going to the brain, but they still feel these sensations. So here is an example from Ramachandran's work where he showed that if a patient who has an amputation, his face is touched or his stump is touched, he gets this kind of sensations. How does that happen? I will give you more reasons later on why we need to understand brain plasticity. Before I explain that, I have to take you through a little small part of the circuit which enables sense of touch. It is actually something very simple. We have sensors in the skin spread throughout. Somewhere there are more, somewhere there are less, somewhere there are less. These are one kind of sensors, the pressure sensors. That's what touch is all about. These pressure sensors bring information from the skin through the spinal cord, which has very few neurons, but essentially it's a huge cable made up of a lot of wires, those processes of neurons that we talked about information back and forth from the brain to the muscles or muscles to the brain or from the sensors in the skin or eyes or nose or wherever to the brain. That's what uh, these things do. So from there the information goes to another structure to the base of the brain. In the lower right hand corner I have put a picture of a human brain so that you know the relative location of what areas I am talking about. Uh, there the information is processed, it's modulated and goes on to another structure which is in the central part of the brain, you cannot see it from outside. And so on and so forth to the outermost part of the brain, we call it neocortex. 
So all this information processing network through which the information about the touch is going ends up resulting it create percept of whatever we are touching, a tactile percept. And then that information further in the network is combined with visual input, with the auditory input to create a complete whole percept of the world around us. What happens in case of spinal cord injury? On the right you see a small injury to the spinal cord pointed by that red arrow. But on the left side, lower left side, I show you a small injury, an experimental injury that can be made which interrupts this flow of information from the skin to the base of the brain. So information from the hand is now not going to the brain. With the result that all these blue regions that you see which are actually getting information from the hand do not get any information. But that's not the only network. There is a parallel, very similar network that is bringing information from the face that's shown in orange here that does not pass through the spinal cord because Face is above the spinal cord that remains intact. In, after spinal cord injuries, what happens? If you wait for some time, we and many scientists have shown this, all the blue becomes orange. What has happened? All the regions that were earlier processing information from the hand now process information from the face. This is what is brain plasticity. This is a very large brain-wide reorganization. Brain has changed completely. How did that happen? Why should we worry about it? Why should we care? I told you an example that phantom sensation likely caused by something like that. Whatever was hand face, now you touch on the face, it feels like hand because the hand region has become a face region. Here is another example. This is the work coming out of a lab in Austria where they looked at the brains of patients who had amputation. On the left side you see the response in the brain to the movement of the fingers when the re-implantation, we call it re-implantation because the patient's own hand was put back uh, two hours after the amputation and the activity has all come back. On the right hand side you see a brain where the transplant was done many years after the amputation and the brain has not become normal because brain has previously reorganized because of the amputation. So we need to understand what is happening to the brain and why it is happening so that doctors can help this patient. Same thing is true for spinal cord injury patients. Because if it becomes possible in the future to connect those wires, which is not possible right now, to restore that connectivity across the site of injury in the spinal cord. We need to make sure that the brain works normally. If brain does not work normally, the recovery will not be complete, as you say in this case of transplantation of the hand many years after amputation. Here is a quick run through uh, with some of the work that my talented graduate students did, which required a lot of innovation in terms of inventing some instruments to make it possible. These are hard experiments, they were not easy, they had to make some instruments to do it, they had to believe that it could be done, and this is what they found. Uh, what they found was that in case of spinal cord injury, the key change that happens at the brainstem level, at the lower most, at the earlier processing level. And now you imagine there is a hot water pipe and there is a cold water pipe. And cold water is stopped and somewhere you connect the hot water and the cold water pipe. Wherever the cold water was flowing now becomes a hot water pipe. And that is exactly what happens to the higher areas of the brain. The information from the face is just flowing up and up and up. So essentially the finding here was which was hard to find and hard to believe that a small change in the circuit at the base of the brain essentially causes the entire brain to change. It's a, like a, if you remember I told you it's a huge interconnected network. So whatever happens in one part of the network affects the rest of the network. This also has another uh, message 
that if we have to help patients with amputations, spinal cord injuries, or transplant, where we want to do transplant, and we want to ensure that wrong sensations are not there, like certain sensations, and a better recovery is there, this is the region that we need to target. So these are the two things that we found out by believing in something that was not believed in the literature. The traditional view was that it is the higher areas of the brain which are more plastic, which are new, are the ones that are going to change, or maybe the change will be everywhere. That's where my students successfully push the horizon. Thank you very much.